So I'm going to talk to you today about heritage and social justice, but I'm going to reflect particularly on the ways in which I've engaged in this as a heritage practitioner. We're going to explore why heritage is important to questions of historical justice and recognition today. We're going to ask how calls for a more honest engagement with colonial histories have shaped, first of all, public heritage in relation to monuments and statues, and secondly, thinking about museums, their responsibilities and repatriation. And moving throughout through all of this is, is thinking about what this tells us about the ways in which pasts shape the present. So I mentioned that I was coming at this from the point of view of a, of a heritage professional. So prior to coming to UCL, um, I've worked as a curator of an anthropology collection at the Horniman Museum, which is in South London um, in Forest Hill. Forest Hill. So the Horniman opened in 1901. Um, and I'll show you a picture of its anthropology galleries. So what is an anthropology collection? Um, anthropology is the study of um, human cultures and society um, across the world. Um, it's often the study of things that um, help us create identity, that define us um, and, and make us different, um, but also um, things that we share um, as human beings. Uh, the history of anthropology is deeply entangled with the history of colonialism. And that is something that has been really important to the way that I've thought about my own practice as somebody who has the privilege of working um, with a collection from across the world um, that was itself um, brought together as a result of various forms of um, colonial presence and governance. So because the Horniman is located in Britain, Many of those who donated collections to the museum were white um, British people who had themselves played a role in the colonial project. So they may have been colonial officers, missionaries, um, or worked in the colonial military. Now the Horniman has collected um, objects after the period of independence in the 1960s, um, but most of its collections come from that colonial era. Now it's important to recognize that that means that we have to think very carefully about our, what our responsibilities with regards to this, the futures of those collections are. Partly that's because of the way in which they were acquired. So um, although a colonial officer may well have purchased um, an item from somebody, the transactions that meant that they were able to amass objects was always one of inequality. In some instances, it was one of direct violence. And you may have heard in the press, for example, um, calls for repatriation from the Nigerian government in relation to the military incursion into Benin City in 1897. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. The other thing that I always think about in my role is that although I have referred to the objects as collections and as objects, they are in fact belongings. So when we think about the way that we engage with our own material heritage, so, you know, look around you, the things that you associate with your family, with your identity, with where you belong, are much more than objects. They're things that are imbued with memories and with stories. And the way that we engage with those things is through touch, uh, is through smell. It's not through looking them at them through a glass, glass case. So my responsibility as a museum curator is both in terms of the history of those collections and the histories of duress that enabled them, that meant that they came to the museum that I work in, but it's also about recognizing what those objects mean to people today. And my responsibility in terms of ensuring that I, or trying to ensure that I show the right respect when I work with those objects and whose knowledge and whose stories I prioritize. Just to give you a little bit of a history of the Horniman, because this is really important to what we're gonna go on to talk about next. So you will have noticed that the Horniman is a strange name for a museum, and it, it comes from the name of its founder, Frederick Horniman. So Frederick Horniman has this reputation as a good man. He was a liberal MP. He was uh, an active abolitionist. So he came, campaigned in parliament against the slave trade. Um, he was also a Quaker. And uh, his reputation as a good charitable man is something that still influences the way that the museum operates and works today. 
So that charity comes from the opening of the museum in 1901 um, and Horniman's donation to the people of London of both the building and also his collections. But the wealth that enabled Horniman to, to become involved in this act of charity or generosity um, needs to be looked at more carefully. So Horniman inherited his wealth from his father, John Horniman, and together they ran a very successful business called Horniman's Tea. Um, Horniman was actually at the time in 1901, one of the richest um, men in London and in Britain as a whole. And that wealth uh, came from his business, but it's important to recognize that that business was only profitable because of forms of um, entitlement and exploitation uh, with regards to land and resources and labor um, in the British empire. So tea is a very labor intensive product to grow. Um, and the conditions under which those who were employed um, in tea plantations were not those that would have been acceptable by the labour standards, for example, uh, um, uh, put in place in Britain, who Horniman himself campaigned for. Second, we need to think about entitlement to land. So um, in order to build a plantation to grow tea in the volumes that would have made the tree, the tea profitable, uh, land needed to be owned and enclosed um, by plantation holders who were often British, particularly in places such as East Africa in Kenya, um, but also in India and uh, Sri Lanka at the time, Ceylon. We also uh, need to think about the colonial exploitation of trade laws. So most of Horniman's tea actually came from China. Now, the British didn't necessarily own plantations in China. However, they forcefully put in place trade agreements as a result of um, what are called opium wars, which is where um, the British uh, overrode declarations from the emperor to not to prohibit the sale in opium um, by injecting the market with opium and therefore lowering the price of tea. So. Whilst Horniman has this reputation as a good man, that, that he was only able to, to play that role um, because of exploitation enabled as a result of um, the British Empire. Just to highlight that this critique um, isn't mine, and like most, most critiques or critical accounts of um, colonial individuals and also histories, they come from a point of public activism. For example, in 2022, um, in the aftermath of the huge um, public protests in support of Black Lives Matter um, in Britain and also in the US, but actually also globally, uh, the Horniman was added to a crowdsourced map of UK statues and monuments that celebrate slavery and racism called Topple the Racists. And this include um, statues um, to, for example, Edward Colston in, in Bristol, and we'll talk about that a little bit, bit later people like Robert um, Mulligan, whose statue is outside the Docklands. So just to highlight that um, the positioning of the Horniman on this list was really in relation to two things that we've mentioned already. The first is the monumentalization and the commemoration of, of, of men, and they nearly always are men, who played an active role in um, colonial impressions, uh, oppressions or enslavements. And the second um, is in relation to the collections and how those collections were acquired and the inequalities that underpin that. So we're going to begin, begin, we're going to begin by talking a little bit about statues and monuments. So as you may know, in um, 2020, in the aftermath of those protests in support of Black Lives Matter, there was a, a, a kind of a, a, a re-intensification of public scrutiny on um, monuments to uh, colonialists and people who were um, themselves um, engaged in um, the enslavement of people. So, for example, in the top left hand corner there, you've got um, the statue of Robert Mulligan that was removed from a plinth outside the Museum of Docklands in London. You may well have heard of the campaign Roads Must Fall, which began in Cape Town in South Africa, but then came to Oriel College in Oxford, relating to calls to remove a memorial or a statue um, commemorating Cecil Rhodes, who played a prominent role in um, the institutionalization of apartheid. Then we have Winston Churchill, um, 
an interesting one because of the centrality of Winston Churchill to ideas of British nationhood. Winston Churchill is somebody who is openly celebrated um, uh, in many different ways um, and really associated with um, the end of the Second World War as a sort of a foundational pivotal moment in the way that um, British history is oriented. But he's also a figure who played an active role um, in, um, in colonial oppression. And so he play he's, you know, these figures aren't, they're, they're, they're often complicated. And the ways in which we choose to commemorate reflect our, our values and our priorities, but also kind of politics and power, as much as they reflect the realities of somebody's presence and what they what they achieved and what they did. <clears throat> I've got a photograph on the bottom left-hand corner there of um of uh um, General Gordon, whose uh, statue was erected um, outside the palace in Khartoum uh, in, the, in around 1900, um, but whose statue was removed uh, at Sudanese um, independence in 1953. And I just want to include that to highlight that the removal of statues isn't something that began in 2020, but it's something that has a long history with post-colonial protest and independence movements. It's interesting to think a little bit about why public heritage is a place where broader calls for social justice become kind of pivoted and pinned down. It is often because heritage, whether that be monuments and statues or museums or official heritage sites, are often legitimators of history, of particular values, as much as they are a kind of neutral remnants or lesser remnants of the past. And so because of that public recognition as, a, as, a, as, a, as an institutional legitimization of the past, they hold power. And so social issues that aren't necessarily to do with nationhood, so for example, if we think about Black Lives Matter and police brutality, become um, attached to questions around heritage. I just wanted to give you a little bit of a case study surrounding the removal of the statue, um, the memorial to Edward Colston in Bristol um, in June 2020, because I think this highlights some really important things. So the statue to Edward Colston, just to give you a bit of an introduction, actually, first Edward Colston, um, uh, he was um, personally and um, professionally enrolled in, uh, in the enslavement um, of Africans and the transatlantic slave trade, and his wealth um, played an important role in uh, the building of the sort of the urban infrastructure of Bristol. Um, so Colston actually died in 1721, but his statue was erected in 1895, 174 years later. Sometimes in public discourse around monuments and statues, it's almost as if monuments and statues have always existed, that they've always been an important part of the marking of public history in public space. But actually most monuments in the UK were erected within a kind of 20 year period between sort of 1890 and 1910. And this was really, first of all, it was the kind of the heyday of Victorian imperialism, but it was also a moment of, of sort of intense um, nationhood building uh, as a result of uh, the end of the Industrial Revolution and the concentration of wealth in urban centers and the, the need to kind of mark that um, with particular modes of commemoration. So the statue to Edward Colston sat on a plinth for 125 years, um, where it was party to critique, uh, particularly from the 1990s in a long-standing campaign, questioning um, the memorial to somebody who participated in genocide. On the 6th of June, 2020, um, during uh, protests in support of Black Lives Matter, um, protesters pulled the statue down. And a few days later, um, he, well, actually on the 6th of June, he was chucked into the River Avon, but then a few days later on the 11th of June, he was pulled out by Bristol's local authority. Why was he pulled out of the, of the Avon? Well, it was felt that he needed to be put in a museum. Um, because of public outcry at the removal of the statue, 
uh, there was a sense that this needed a process of consultation. So the statue to Edward Colston was um, mounted um, at Emshed, a museum in Bristol, as part of a public consultation about what should happen next. Should he be reinstalled uh, or should he be um, retained in the, in the museum's uh, archives? But also how should that history be told? Um, the interesting thing about this is a few things. So first of all, it's the question of once a statue is removed, is that act of removal a really important, um, what's that about? Uh, in the kind of the debates that were happening both in the public and in the press, but also in political sectors at the time, there was a suggestion, there was the argument that by removing statues, you are in effect erasing history or you're disabling the telling of history by removing its physical traces. Within this argument, statues and monuments are conceived of as archives, right? As material remnants of the past to be mined for historical truths. But of course, statues and monuments are far more than archives. They are part of our built physical infrastructure. You can choose to go and read an archive or read a book if you want to engage critically or not with British imperial history. But if you live in a city, it's very difficult to avoid walking past memorials to men who participated in oppression and enslavement. Um, David Olasuga was very is a is a sort of a, a public historian, um, and uh, he was very uh, created um, very vocal at the time, particularly on the effects of statues to people of color whose families' histories are themselves um, entangled with um, that oppression. And so this is not just uh, about a British history, but it's also about a personal history and the fact that that colonial history continues to impact upon the ways in which people live today, including, for example, its reinscription through forms of structural racism, um, but also uh, the, the omissions of historical truths in the telling of British history. So, for example, I mentioned Winston Churchill. Writers like Paul Gilroy have spoken about how British history sort of ends in 1948 in the way that it's taught in schools. Um, but it glosses over the 1950s and the 60s and the kind of the fall and the decline of the British Empire and the impact of that on migrations of people to the UK um, and their experience of, of life today. I want to move on by thinking a bit more specifically about the importance of thinking about this in relation to museums and the histories of collections. So I'm going to give you a bit of poetry because I think poets often speak uh, historical truths in ways that really underpin um, that personal connection with history, which is so central to the way that we think about the past um, as kind of heritage practitioners, but also thinkers thinking with heritage. Um, I'm going to give you quote you a piece of poetry by Suhaim Mansur Khan, who's written a brilliant anthology called Postcolonial Banter. Her poem is entitled Where Is My History? My history is imprinted in the spaces between the ink printed on press pages. My history is the scream shouting out through the silent slots in syllabi. It is caged in glass cases said to be for its own safety by the institutions which narrate it as their own. Because my history lies in the choices not recorded about which stories should be hoarded and called archives. So when you ask where my past is, ask instead, what's yours without mine? She tells it much better herself. So here, this piece of poetry is in response to a question, where am I in what is called the subject of history? And I'm just going to read you a little quote from her anthology that gives you a bit more context. Such placement of my history is an outcome of the decisions that go into selecting what is an historical document and what is not. What piece of evidence is an important part of the story of the past and what piece of evidence is not? What is a scribble on a piece of paper? What is a source? What is an oral history and what is a story told by a grandma? 
The decisions that make some sources or stories about the past more valid are not accidental, but always political. The stories we tell about the past are stories we're trying to consolidate about the present. This is also a question of artifacts and archives, of how they came to be in Britain's museums, but also how they are framed. What I think is so important about the way that she articulates her thinking behind her piece of poetry is what, she's, what she des describes as what is and what is not the historical archive, and the fact that how history is told is always political. So if you've um, studied, for example, an A-level of history, you will have engaged with historiography. So the importance of recognizing that when we read archives, we're reading a selective, um, a selective trace. So we're reading accounts by those people who are literate. Uh, we're reading the accounts by those people who um, were in a position of power that meant that what they wrote down was kept. And we're also reading record, records that say something about the values and priorities of the people who have decided what should be kept, what should be archived, and what should be thrown away. But what Sohaimor is also talking about is the importance of recognizing that history often sits in the home. It sits in our own experience. Uh, the stories that we tell with our families, um, but also our experience as individuals and as individuals who are part of, of communities. And those stories aren't necessarily archived. Uh, they may be oral histories, so they may be things that are told by a grandma, but even oral histories in the formal sense need a process by which an oral historian or an archivist records somebody speaking and puts it in the archive. But actually, most of our sense of the past is fleeting, right? It's not archival. And when we go to um, public archival institutions like museums or look at the ways in which our pasts are represented in public spaces, so for example, museums and monuments, uh, that sense of kind of personhood and emotion and family is absent. And that is particularly so for Sohaima, who writes from the perspective of being a Muslim woman, a Muslim British woman, and trying to understand why her experience of the past and her experience of her identity is not reflect reflected in those official places of heritage making. So as I said before, museums and monuments, they have a power because they are in a sense legitimators of which historical truths count and which do not. So when a particular experience is absent, that has an implication for the way in which history is told at a kind of an institutional level, how it's taught in schools, for example. So in terms of that question of thinking about who is acknowledged or who leads in the interpretation of history, I wanted to introduce a project that I've been working at at the Horniman for the past few years that's led by Sherry Davis. Sherry Davis is a musician and a filmmaker, but her grandfather, Carissa Ndura, was a foreman who worked as an archaeologist in Kenya in the 1950s and 60s. The project is about recognising that the names that are associated with historical archives when it comes to the establishment of heritage relating to Kenya are often those of the white British archeologists or historians who have participated in the writing of that history. And those African Kenyan foremen, archeologists, laborers, researchers who have contributed to that knowledge are rarely acknowledged and their contribution isn't really seen. Sherry's grandfather, Chris Ndura worked with James Kirkman and it, the project started with her realization that his name is nowhere to be found at a site in Mombasa called Fort Jesus. And so she began by working with colleagues at National Museums of Kenya to do archival research, looking at photographs from archeological excavations taken during that time and naming the individuals in those photographs through a combination of archival research and oral history work. The exhibition is on at the Horniman at the moment uh, and is open until December 2023 and really worth um, going to see.
Sherry Davis's project Ode to the Ancestors is really important for helping us think about the relationship between social justice and heritage in three core ways. The first is in recognizing that heritage is always personal. So for Sherry, this was about ensuring that her granddad uh, was recognized and commemorated in a way that was appropriate to the life that he lived. Secondly, it is about thinking about archives, who gets to be acknowledged in the interpretation of history and who isn't acknowledged as somebody who produces those narratives. Now, this is really important because it tells us something about power. Often those who are named in the ways in which heritage is told, so thinking back to monuments, are those who have power. And in a context um, of uh, colonial era Kenya, that is often intersects with colonial power. And therefore, um, who gets acknowledged is often those um, who have sat in, in places of power as a result of, of imperialism. Thirdly, it tells us something really important about the significance of the experiences and priorities and positionalities of those who interpret history in the decisions that are made about what histories get told. History is always selective. Um, so when we think about the ways in which uh, Victorian Britain is commemorated in the UK through particular monuments and the names of particular individuals, we understand that there are a whole load of other experiences and presences that are, that are absent from that telling of history. I want to conclude by thinking a little bit about repatriation which is something that intersects directly with social justice and heritage um, and is not so much about the telling of history, but it's about or the telling of heritage, but it's about the return of objects that have in the context that I'm going to talk about now been um, taken under context of duress as a result of colonial power inequalities. Now, what is repatriation? Repatriation is often the return of something to a land of origin. And when it comes to museum collections, repatriation is often the return to something to a nation state. Other words that we can use are restitution, which is a bit broader. So something can be restituted to a community, for example, rather than a nation or simply return. I'm going to talk particularly about Benin and the return of what are known as the Benin bronzes in the media. Um, to the government of Nigeria um, as, as something that I experienced and worked on at the Horniman over the last four years. So why is this something, why is this important? Well, first, I think it's important to talk a little bit about the history of the ways in which museums across the world have acquired these objects. In February 1897, British colonial military um, invaded uh, Benin City, and in particular the Royal Palace um, in the centre of Benin City. And not only did they destroy the palace and the surrounding towns, um, but they also engaged in mass looting of objects that were um, sovereign objects uh, and really central and very important to the palace. These objects were then returned to Britain in 1897, and they were, um, first of all, circulated through private hands. So individual soldiers, um, members of the Navy, but also doctors who were part of the expedition, um, kept items in their private homes, but also sold them to private dealers. But a lot of objects um, made their way to museums. Actually, these objects have um, been at the museum since then. Most of the objects that the Frederick Corneman bought were acquired in a two year period between um, 1897 and 1899, and they have been on display and sat in storage since then. The museum rec received a formal request from the Nigerian government in January last year for the return of objects that had been looted. And so we've been working since then, first of all, to try and understand which those objects are. It's interesting to think about how museums um, record information about the situations in which objects first were taken from their point of origin and then entered the museum collection. Often those archives aren't particularly detailed, mm -hmm. but for the purposes of this, we were thinking very much about anything that the museum um, brought into its collection, thinking that it had been looted is enough really to determine a moral argument for its return.
So after receiving the request, um, we undertook research and we did consultations both with Nigerian community members in London and also um, with some of our visitors about the future of the collection. And it was decided by the museum's trustees, which is the governing board that um, makes decisions about really important decisions about the museum and its future uh, and its finances, for example, um, that the request would be granted. So why is it important for museums like the Horniman to return objects that are known to have been violently stolen during the colonial period? Well, for a museum like the Horniman, I think we have to ask ourselves, what are museums with objects from all over the world really about? Are they about the telling of history? Whose history? Sometimes people argue that holding on to objects that were looted can tell us something important about British colonial history and they can allow our visitors to come and think critically about British heritage. But these objects are not just about British heritage or British history. They are also, I mean, they are fundamentally about the heritage of the Royal Court of Benin City um, and also the Nigerian state. Another thing that museums like the Hornman might say there about is um, an opportunity to come and understand something of the creativity of people uh, that live all over the world. Here's an example of the gallery that currently displays some of the objects from Benin. Um, quite a few of these have now returned actually to Nigeria. And you can see there a market stall. Now, what this display is trying to do is to talk about Nigeria as a vibrant and incredibly diverse nation. Uh, that is full of um, artistry and skill and has its own history, but it's impossible to do that in a way that's truthful and respectful and relevant, whilst we also show objects that have been violently looted. The two don't really go hand in hand. So that's the conclusion of my lecture. I hope that you've enjoyed it. Um, I've explored some of the ways in which we might think about the relationship between social justice and heritage. 